Welcome back to Your Health Radio and Television Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm so pleased you could be with us today. For the third, third segment today, I'd like to talk about one of the most common operations in my practice. That's breast augmentation. There are, there are a lot of myths and fallacies and misconceptions about breast augmentation out there. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about breast augmentation and what it's all about. In my office, I will start out with asking a woman really what she wants in terms of uh, size, and I'll take a careful history about does she want to be higher, has she had children, has she done breastfeeding, et cetera. It's very interesting. I think in my practice, I have two, I guess, predominant groups of women that request breast, breast augmentation. First of all, uh, there is a woman who comes in who says that she really enjoyed being bigger and fuller and rounder when she was breastfeeding. And now that the kids are older and she's not breastfeeding or having children anymore, she kind of misses having that type of volume. And she notes that her breasts are somewhat droopy and lack volume. I think the other set of uh, wom women that I see commonly is the woman that comes in and says that her mom was big, her sisters are big, a lot many of her friends are big, but for some reason she seems to miss out on the, the breast size and she wants to be more like the other members of her family. So I tell women that there are pros and cons to everything we do in plastic surgery, including breast augmentation and of course including life. Every decision that we make in life and in plastic surgery there are pros and cons. The advantages or pros that I see to breast augmentation uh, are that one day, safely, you get to be bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher in one day safely. Once again, the advantages or pros that I see to breast, breast augmentation, in one day, safely, you get to be bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher. Now, the downsides to breast augmentation are essentially uh, all the downsides are that, uh, that we see commonly revolve around the use of implants. Now, after I talk about implants, I am going to talk about sort of an autogenous fat transplantation that we're doing some for cosmetic breast augmentation. W that's when we do liposuction and then transfer the fat to the breast. But more commonly, we, more commonly we, do breast we do breast implants. So. The, advan the disadvantages to the use of breast implants are certainly there are permanent visible scars. There are, uh, there's a possibility of a change in nipple sensation. Implants can leak. There can be capsular contracture. Now I think it's worth taking, taking a moment to talk about capsular contracture. A capsular contracture is the process whereby the normal scar tissue that forms around an, around an implant starts to squeeze. Thereby the breast implant almost becomes like it feels hard. Now, it's important to emphasize that the implant itself does not become hard, but it's the, it's the scar tissue around an implant that starts to contract and get thicker and squeeze, thereby resulting in more of a, a firm or hard feeling. So again, implants can leak. Uh, I have to make incisions somewhere so there can be permanent visible scars. Uh, capsule contracture can occur. There can be infection extrusion, migration. I mentioned a change in nipple sensation. Nationwide, about 15% of women who undergo breast augmentation will have a change in nipple sensation, either increased sensation or decreased sensation. Now, I think that's important to emphasize. About 15% of women will have increased or decreased sensation of their nipple or rela complex following breast augmentation. Now, in addition, if a woman has a breast augmentation and in the future, she decides to become pregnant or bear children, then I like to use this phrase that all bets are off. A woman might get big again. She may or may not be able to breastfeed. Uh, she may get big on one side. If she gets big or becomes engorged, she may develop some sagging breasts again. So if a woman intends on having more children in the future or becoming pregnant, then I like to use that phrase, all bets are off. Now, there's another important issue to address with breast augmentation and that's breast surveillance. All women need to do and learn self-breast exam. That includes women who, are getting, who, who, who do have or who are getting breast implants. And in terms of mammography or mammograms, 
special views are required. So I think it's important for any woman with breast implants is to simply Im inform the mammography tech that she has breast implants in place and so special views are required. So in summary, the advantage to breast implants or breast augmentation, a woman gets to be bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher safely. The downside is permanent visible scars. I guarantee all women that the edge of the implant can be felt. Sometimes it can be seen. There can be infection, extrusion, migration. Implants can, can actually leak, and we can talk about that, and we can talk about the differences between saline and silicone. Capsular contracture can occur. That's an important issue in breast implantation. And of course, childbearing issues, all bets are off, and women with breast implants need special surveillance. Now, my role as a plastic surgeon is not only to do an excellent operation for a woman, but to help her make decisions that tilt the balance in her favor. In other words, we want to tilt the balance towards her being bigger, fuller, rounder, and a little bit higher, and away from being able to feel the edge of the implant, capsular contracture, infection, extrusion, migration, etc. Well, how do we do that? Well, with breast augmentation, there are many decisions to be made. There are four different incisions. Under, underneath the breast tissue in the crease, that's called the inframammary approach. Through the armpit, that's called the axillary approach. Just at the edge underneath of the areola, that's the infraperiareolar approach. And there's one more approach that I'd like to mention just for completeness, and that's through the umbilicus or, th or through the belly button. That's called the transumbilical approach. The reason why I say just to mention it for completeness is that some of the breast implant manufacturers look down upon that or frown upon it because the implant, the saline implant, has to be rolled up like a cigar and placed in a metal tube and passed up to the breast area and then inflated. Well, in doing so, sometimes the breast implant can be um, damaged and so the warranty is not honored. But the three most common ways to, to approach the breast augmentation or approach the pocket is underneath, just underneath the areola or through the armpit. In my practice, it just happens to be the most commonly used approach is in the inframammary crease, just underneath the breast. That seems to heal very well in most women, and the scar is relatively inconspicuous given some months. Now, what, are, what other decisions to be made are there? We can go above and below the pectoralis muscle. Um, we can use saline or silicone. That's a big decision to be made. There are different manufacturers. We can go saline or silicone, and there are certainly differences. And we can order almost unlimited sizes. Now, here's a very important point to be made that even though we order different sizes, we cannot predict cup size. It's vital to emphasize because all bra manufacturers are different. All lingerie manufacturers are different. And Victoria's Secret, and Johnson & Johnson, and Playtex, and Cross Your Heart, there's no real uniformity to measuring a woman's cup size. In fact, I spoke to someone in the pretty high echelons of Victoria's Secret not too long ago, and she told me in a, a two-year period, they changed the way that they measure a cup size three times. So even among companies, the way to measure a cup size is not, con not consistent. So we can order by volume, and we can order by width and projection of an implant. I commonly use something in my office called a biodimensional approach. I take many different measurements of a woman's torso and breasts, and we typically offer her four different sizes, but we cannot predict her cup size. Now, in general, I offer a woman, based on her dimensions and her measurements, four different choices, small, medium, large, and extra large in terms of augmentation. And that can vary dramatically between a woman who is 5'6 and weighs 100 pounds and a woman who is 6'2 and weighs 175 pounds. A large augmentation for the more petite woman will be totally different than the large augmentation for the, for the taller or larger woman. So again, I need to emphasize we cannot predict cup size. Now, what about the choice between saline and silicone? There certainly are real differences between saline and silicone. There's no question about, about the safety of saline. You know, saline is salt water in relative concentration to the same 
that's found in our bloodstream, like, like serum, saline is a, a normal saline, and so that's salt water. If a saline implant leaks, you know it within a day. It simply deflates like a, like a water balloon, but, but slowly over the course of a day. And so there'll be no question that a, a, a woman will know if the saline implant deflates. And there's really no question about the safety because it's just saline, salt water that we have in our body, and a woman will know it right away. However, with silicone, a woman can have a silent leak or silent rupture. It's unlikely that she will know it that day, especially with a micro tear or micro leak. If for some reason uh, a silicone breast implant would rupture, it's likely that a woman will feel some discomfort soon thereafter and can see her plastic surgeon or see her doctor. But if she has a micro leak with a silicone implant, it's unlikely she will know it that day. For that reason, I tell all women who are selecting silicone breast implants that they need to do special surveillance, they need to do special, special self-breast exams, and they need to be followed. Some manufacturers will even direct you to get an MRI three years after the placement. So, so with silicone implants, they require special surveillance. Now, the advantage to silicone is that it feels more like flesh. Depending on where it's placed and how much tissue there is between your fingers and hands and feeling the breast implant and if we go above and below the muscle. If a, breast, if a silicone breast implant stays soft, it's very hard to tell it's there. It, it, it really uh, feels more like flesh. Whereas a saline implant is a little more firm, especially in the outer lower quadrant. Sometimes there can be little crinkles, almost like you're feeling a water balloon. Some women feel that a silicone breast implant looks better. I'm not sure that that's true. Again, it, it really is influenced by many factors. But some women feel that a, breast a silicone breast implant looks better. Now, I think it is important to emphasize that the more modern or current breast implants we get, in including silicone, leak far less often than the older implants. And capsular contracture, or the hardening or thickening of the scar tissue around an implant, we used to tell women that with silicone implants, it's much more common. But it seems that the new data, especially with more cohesive gel implants, is that it's relatively about the same percentage. It varies, but it's roughly 7% of the time a woman will develop a symptomatic capsular contracture. Now, capsular contracture, of course, in and of itself is a topic we could talk about for hours, but there are four grades. Everyone gets some capsule. In other words, if we put an implant into the body, whether it's a heart valve or a knuckle replacement, breast implant, artificial hip, the body will make a natural scar tissue around it. For some reason, in capsule contracture, that, that scar tissue starts to squeeze and thicken. So everybody gets a grade one capsule. Grade two is where the breast implant and the breast looks fine, but when you touch it, it feels more firm. A grade three capsule contracture is where you can tell even by looking that there's a, that there's a squeezing or thickening of the capsule. And grade four capsule contracture is when there are constitutional symptoms where a woman just feels some discomfort or even pain or some cold intolerance with the breast imp implant in place because of the capsule contracture. So uh, I think there are many decisions to be made uh, when choosing uh, a breast augmentation procedure. And I think I can help a woman with almost all of the decisions to be made but there are two decisions that I think are very personal ones. The first personal decision that I think to be made is roughly what size you want to be. Now, keeping in mind, we cannot predict cup size, but in general, do you want a small or very modest augmentation? Do you want sort of a medium augmentation, quite large or pronounced augmentation, or do you want to go extra large in the, in the degree of, of increase in size? So that's the first personal decision to be made is roughly what size. The, the second personal decision to be made is do you want saline or silicone? And I said, as I said, there are, there are pros and cons to each way. In general, uh, the advantage to silicone is it feels more like flesh, it leaks less often than silicone, but of course the downside to silicone is that if it leaks, you're just not gonna know it, know it right away. But I think with the newer silicone implants being cohesive, what that means is, is if there is a tear 
or incompetence in the shell that the silicone won't run out all over the place like this sort of old, sort of very liquidy silicone gel used to be. Today's silicone is more cohesive. In other words, if you interrupt the shell, then the, then the silicone pretty much stays where it is. It's contained even in, within the shape of the implant. It doesn't run out all over. So, in summary, that's the story of breast augmentation. And if you'd like more information, please call my office. I'm in Monterey. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon. My phone number is 831-646-8661. That's Dr. David Morwood, 831-646-8661. Or go to drmorwood.com, D-R-M-O-R-W-O-O-D, drmorwood.com. Once again, thank you so very much for being, being here today. This has been Your Health radio and television program. Thanks so much for being here and stopping by. I hope you tune in again.